Welcome to this series of conversations with 1970s Grable alumni. Today, I'm getting a chance to catch up with David Franzen, who until right now, I haven't seen since college days, about 45 years ago. That's one of the great parts about this particular gig, I guess. So it's so great to see you, Dave. Likewise, Larry, I've been looking forward to this. When last we spoke, I, it must have been about 1976 or so. You had graduated from Canadian Mennonite Bible College, now Canadian Mennonite University, and you were embarking on graduate studies in history at the University of Waterloo. So I want to rewind your career to the early 1970s. You graduated from high school. Grable was here then, beckoning students just like you. But what made you decide to choose CNBC in Winnipeg? I think primarily for two reasons, kind of at a meta level. Uh, our family, the Franzen family, had had long uh, history with uh, CNBC. Uh, my grandfather helped raise funds for it way back in the 40s and 50s. And I had uncles who had attended, et cetera. So there was that, there was a bit of a family connection there. And then more personally, um, Henry Petko and I were very close friends. Uh, Henry preceded me by one year. That's where he was going. And so I thought, well, that sounds like it might be a fun place to go. Let's just go. So it was no more profound than that. So you did your theology degree there, and then you embarked on graduate studies in history at the University of Waterloo. You didn't end up living in residence, um, but you chose to become a Grable associate. Why was that important to you? Immediately after graduating from CNBC, I also got married. Uh, and so Barb and I, uh, when we moved to Waterloo, uh, moved into an apartment off campus. Um, I'm not even sure whether there were married student apartments in those days, uh, but uh, we decided we were gonna live off campus. And also, um, I guess the other kind of more uh, practical reason is that first year in Waterloo, I was actually working half time for the uh, United Mennonite Conference of Ontario as youth worker. I was their first youth worker. So I wasn't a full-time student. Um, so anyway, but I wanted a connection uh, with, with Grable. And the reason Waterloo had been very attractive to us University of Waterloo had been very attractive to us because there was a relationship between U of W and University of Manitoba, whereby the credits that to, you know that we got at CNBC counted at University of Manitoba, those credits were accepted by the University of Waterloo. So there was a very strong organic connection. And um, Grable was a very nice, comfortable place, uh, transition place coming out of CNBC and heading into the university. Yeah, you're certainly right. I don't think Grable had married students residences at that point. I think the University of Waterloo did. They had a couple of married students towers, but uh, not Grable. Right. Uh, you eventually did your uh, doctorate in history at the University of Toronto. But were there certain people at Grable or at Waterloo who had a major impact on your thinking or your career? Yeah, I mean, that was a particularly fertile time. For, for me, uh, an, an important transition period, I guess, from kind of where I had been at CNBC to where I eventually ended up at, at U of T. Um, during the, the years at Grable, uh, I, uh, I, I began by doing some research work, uh, being a researcher for Frank Gett, uh, who was at that point writing uh, the second volume of Mennonites in Canada. And uh, in particular, he uh, had me doing some research uh, on conscientious objection during the Second World War. That eventually gave me the material I needed for my master's thesis. And, and so I could, you know, Frank was obviously a really important figure in my life at that time. Um, he was my supervisor for my, grad, my, my master's. Um, and, but then also there was a general environment there within which a number of us graduate students of, of, at the time. So Henry Petko was a graduate student there. Arnold Snyder, uh, Lyle Friesen was also there. Uh, and the four of us had cubicles back up in the archives uh, together with Sam Steiner. So uh, we formed a pretty interesting kind of 
coffee clatch kind of group that were allowed into the faculty lounge for coffee. And so, you know, I think the entire faculty there were, became friends, colleagues, and mentors. Uh, I think in particular people like uh, Rod Sawatsky and, uh, and Ernie Regeer, who was there with Plowshares, Project Plowshares at the time. So there, it was a very um, stimulating environment where the, the conversations could range from kind of theology, Mennonite history to contemporary politics. And I just, I love that range. And I guess if anything, that, that kind of intellectual stimulation uh, was formative for me in the sense that, uh, and also kind of ended up describing kind of one of the motivations of my career, which is the sense of curiosity. And I didn't dive deep into any one particular field, but ended up kind of chasing a lot of really interesting jobs. You sure did. Um, you went then from Waterloo to Toronto, uh, and uh, then from there to Ottawa, where you uh, began work in the civil servant, c civil service rather, eventually becoming assistant deputy minister at Industry Canada, uh, and uh, a few other high-profile positions. And then came an inflection point. I think you became uh, a, an associate vice president at the University of Waterloo and the executive director. I think it was the first one, maybe. At yeah. the University, uh, sorry, at the Institute for Quantum Computing at Waterloo for two years. So I'm trying to figure out how a guy with degrees in theology and history ends up steering a high tech scientific institute. Well, um, it has nothing to do with substance. Um, and it, it, it becomes actually a pretty good example of uh, that old saying it's not what you know, but who you know. Uh, so when I was working at Industry Canada, one of the, the initiatives that I steered was uh, what was called at the time an expert panel on commercialization. And Joe Rotman from Toronto chaired the panel and it had a number of kind of high powered people from across the country on the panel, um, including Mike Lazaridis. And, and so Mike and I got to know each other. And at that time, uh, the Institute for Quantum Computing was in its early days, uh, but it was starting to grow and grow in a fairly significant way. They were looking, Mike was looking for uh, somebody who could take the management burden away from the scientist who he, whom he had recruited to run the Institute and who really was kind of the, the animating mind and spirit behind the Institute. His name's Ray Laflamme. And, and Mike was looking to kind of offload the management load of that in, in, a, in a new position of executive director. So Mike, um, Mike offered me the job. And, uh, you know, he invited me down to Waterloo. He said, come, on, come on down, take a visit. I want to show you around the place and let's talk. So over lunch, you know, he pitched me on the position. And I, I said, Mike, you know, physics and I parted company in grade 11. And that was a very long time ago. Uh, and his, his comment, I still remember it. Uh, it was, there are only 100 people in the world who understand this science. We have 10 of the best of them here at the Institute. I don't need you to do the science. I need you to help manage. And uh, so, you know, with that kind of understanding, uh, I was, uh, I took a, a leave of absence uh, from Industry Canada to come here. And uh, it was a two year executive interchange agreement that was uh, extended for a third. And uh, before I could return to Industry Canada, I then got the opportunity, the invitation to take the job that, that was coming up in Los Angeles which is where I wanted to go next. You became Canada's Consul General in Los Angeles for six years. What was that like? And what does a Consul General do? Is it, is it administration? Is it diplomacy? Is it both? Uh, it's those two plus um, business development. Um, 
and a number of other things. I mean, the consul general position, think of it as a mini ambassador. So uh, people generally understand what an ambassador does. So we have an ambassador in Washington who represents Canada and Canadian interests to the federal government of the United States. The United States, given its importance to Canada, um, not strictly in terms of what goes on in Washington, but in terms of what goes on across the country, is divided into territories. And each one of these territories is presided over by a consul general. So uh, think of it as being a mini ambassador with responsibility to represent Canada in a particular territory. So it's a representational job. Uh, it has diplomatic dimensions in terms of uh, policy advocacy. It has economic and business dimensions in terms of connecting Canadian business people with counterparts and markets in a territory. It has um, what are consular responsibilities. In other words, if Canadians who are in territory need help of one kind or another, we have a group of people whose duty is to respond to those Canadians. And it has an administrative duty. I mean, I the office in Los Angeles. So the territory I was responsible for is uh, Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada. That would be a fairly busy office, I would think, given, given it, the relationship with between uh, it is. and Canada. It's it's actually larger than almost every other embassy in the world that we that, that Canada has in the world. Well, these days you're still in kind of that environment, right? Uh, you're still in Waterloo, and and you serve, by my count, on at least five different boards, all of them involved in things such as nanotechnology and neurotechnology, renewable energy, sustainability and other tech-based solutions. What interests you in those kinds of firms, the ones that you're involved in now? I guess what unites those, those disparate activities is uh, a desire to be kind of on the leading edge of what's, what's helping people, of what's relevant to kind of uh, to, make, to make change at scale that, that helps people. Uh, my father died of a brain tumor at 39, and my mother just passed away from dementia, from Alzheimer's. So kind of progress in the field of neurotechnology matters to me. What is the college's place in a world of nanotechnology and science and fields such as artificial intelligence, or does, does the school have a place? Oh, absolutely, it has a place. I mean, one of the things I've always been, you know, that, that drew me to Grable in the first place and that continues to draw me back um, is its existence um, kind of on a campus of, uh, you know, a, a, a world leading, a, a university that has world leading edge in certain fields. And, and being able to be a voice in that context uh, to bring uh, to bring a perspective to those conversations that addresses issues that others may not from their uh, may not be willing or prepared to to address the fact that Grable is present and engaged in those conversations is is a is a critical role and I, and I, it's not something that is kind of peripheral it's it's really essential to all of those different pursuits. And I guess, I mean, one of my lessons learned when I was at, uh, when I first arrived at the Institute for Quantum Computing, this is a field of endeavor that is profoundly interdisciplinary. I say that as a metaphor for what I think Grable and other institutions like it bring to so many of these different conversations. So whether you're talking about artificial intelligence, machine learning, nanotechnology, quantum technology, there are ethical issues embedded in these pursuits. And I think Grable provides the opportunity. I'm not saying that it does it all the time. I don't, I, I'm not close enough to say that it does, but it provides the opportunity for faculty and researchers and students to, to get engaged in those conversations. Um, another example, so, you know, we all know about accelerators and technology accelerators and, and you know, there's some really, really good initiatives here in Waterloo. I mean, a world-class 
uh, organizations. You know, the University of Waterloo has an incubator called Velocity that is world class. It, it really, truly is. Um, and the region of Waterloo has uh, an, an association called Communitech that, again, is, you know, the gold standard for how communities should do this. Grable is participating very actively in that through its institute for, um, and I got the, uh, I'm, I'm going to get the name wrong, but um, that, that looks at the connection between technology development and peace and conflict studies and, and how you, can we do technology for peace, technology for good? And, and so it, that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about where uh, the Grable perspective is introduced and embedded in what would otherwise be, a, a, could otherwise be a strictly technology play. And I, that's just a really, really valuable voice, witness, role that Grable can play. Thanks very much for the time you spent today, David. I very much appreciate it. Uh, it was a pleasure, Larry. I'm glad we finally got back together. Uh, say hi to Jackie for, for both Barb and me. Barb's upstairs. I'm sure she can hear this conversation. I will do that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>